Emperor Norton I, the forgotten emperor of the United States. And this was a talk I first put together about 15 years ago or so. And it has changed dramatically. You would think that uh, a character such as this, that history would not change for him, but there's a lot of changes as uh, technology is getting better and we're discovering more and more things from archives about him. So let's just launch right into this. It was 34 years ago, January of 1987, as millions of, Amer of Southern Californians gathered around their TV sets, they were astonished to hear an editorial by John Severino, the news anchor at KABC Channel 7 in Los Angeles, hurling the most sinister accusations at one of the greatest world leaders of the modern times and past eras, and insulting as well a highly esteemed historical organization. And I'm going to quote, here's what he said in his editorial that night. The Clampers are at it again. The Clampers are either a historical drinking society or a drinking historical society. Take your pick. Founded in the gold rush to let off steam, the modern day Clampers continue the tradition of taking a nip while marking California historical sites, sites with more, which more sober historians have missed but the Clampers are now trying to bite off more than their corks. They are collecting signatures to rename the San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge after an eccentric who thought he was the emperor of California. Nobody took Emperor Norton seriously and we don't think the Clampers should be taken seriously either. After all, how serious can a group be which calls its leader the grand noble humbug? This is John Severino. End of quote. Well, even the cloistered nuns at Our Lady of the Mime were stunned in the sacred silence. Across California, citizens wondered, what was the truth? Who could possibly respond to these horrible charges? Luckily, there was someone who rose to the challenge and picked up that, gaunt that gauntlet tossed into the dirt. A rebuttal to Mr. Severino's editorial was aired by KABC shortly afterwards by an alleged clamper named Neil, as the script read under the uh, delivery. In the emperor's honor upheld, the response was, founded in 4005 BC, the oldest fraternal organization known to man, E. Clampus Vitus, supports the renaming of the Oakland Bay Bridge to the Emperor Norton I Bridge, honoring one of California's most colorful figures, Joshua Norton, self-proclaimed emperor of the United States and protector of Mexico. In 1872, the visionary Norton issued a royal decree that suspension bridges link San Francisco to Marin and Oakland and that a tube be built under the sea for transportation to the Hawaiian Islands. 100 years later, we see the results of his decree, the Golden Gate Bridge, the Oakland Bay Bridge, and the yet to be completed BART tube. Joshua Norton deserves to be memorialized in the same fashion as other former California greats, Sam Brannan, Mark Twain, John Wayne, and the Oakland Raiders. End of editorial. Well, that didn't, that, uh, didn't clear things up for too many people. What was Eclampus Vitus? Well, I note that today there's all these different magazines and news doc and uh, documentaries, the History Channel, Time Magazine, National Geographic, all dealing with secret societies, cults, conspiracies, secret societies, on and on. I would like to mention that not one of these publications or exposés or documentaries has ever mentioned E. Clampus Vitus. And I can say no more because I truly, I do not know. So whatever Eclampus Vitus is, it'll just have to remain a secret. As for Joshua Norton, who was Joshua Norton? And here we go. The man who would be emperor was born in England to John and Sarah Norton in 1818. Two years later, his parents, along with 5,000 other British, moved to South Africa. At first they were in Port Elizabeth and then they moved to Cape Town, shown in the photograph here where Norton at age 23 started his own business. He went bankrupt within a year and a half, but his fortune improved following the death of his parents and his two brothers, leaving him in a state of about $40,000. And 
even that amount that I've been told, the $40,000 that I've read here and there has now been challenged because his father was going bankrupt and there was also problems. So if he had $40,000 or he didn't have $40,000 still remains somewhat of a mystery. However, when the news of the gold strike in California reached Cape Town, Joshua Norton took off for the gold fields, which was a journey well over 10,000 miles. So he had to have some sort of financing, some sort of money to get himself to San Francisco. And once in San Francisco, he knew better than to try to make his fortune digging and panning for gold. He set up Joshua Norton and Company, general merchandise, in an old adobe at Jackson and Montgomery Streets. He bought a ship at the harbor, one of many abandoned by the captain and crew, and he used it as a warehouse and also rented out space to others. Now, in May of 1851, the sixth great fire of San Francisco burnt down his business and pretty much everybody else's business. And so San Francisco was slowly getting the message by then, the sixth great fire of a building with canvas and wood. And in the aftermath of the fire, a lot more brick and granite buildings were being built. And Joshua Norton found the new location in a granite building at 110 Battery Street. Now, San Francisco in the early 1850s was just ridden with crime. The judges were corrupt, the police were powerless, the criminals ran rampant through the city. And that was about to change on June 9th, 1851. A man named John Jenkins, he stole a small safe in broad daylight, took off with it, jumped into a boat, but he was caught by the citizens. And those citizens having had enough of crime, corruption and disorder with no law, they tried him and they hung him. And Sam Brannan, a San Francisco businessman, newspaper editor, and community leader, he encouraged the throng, stating, let every lover of liberty and good order lay hold of the rope. And you can see in this drawing here, they're all laying their hands on the rope to pull Jenkins up. Well, that June incident started the San Francisco Committee of Vigilance. And Joshua Norton, seen right up here, Joshua Norton was member number 339 of the 700 or so members, and his address was at the Jones Hotel at the corner of Jackson and Montgomery Street. As far as the vigilante committee went, they started picking up the criminals and trying them themselves, and all it took was four hangings, and the criminal element got the picture. When the Committee of Vigilance sentenced them, they sentenced 14 to go to Australia, they went. They ordered 14 more to leave California, they left. So with crime on the downturn and justice coming back, the San Francisco vigilance folded their sheets and went out of sight and let regular law enforcement take over. They were established again in 1856 when more problems happened. That's a whole other story that we'll save for a different time. So cleansed and rejuvenated uh, following the vigilance committee's gang injunctions, San Francisco grew and prospered and so did Joshua Norton. His business was booming and he was doing well with investments in real estate and he also had a rice mill and a cigar factory. By 1852, some year and a half after the uh, Great Fire, uh, Norton was worth nearly a quarter million dollars which translates to about $5 million in today's money. With his wealth, he was a charter member of the Freemasons in San Francisco, uh, I think lodge number 22 and he moved with ease at the top of San Francisco society. So everything was looking up for a boy that had left South Africa with either no money at all or some money. He was doing pretty darn good in San Francisco. In December of 1852 though, Norton was tempted with an offer he couldn't refuse. A famine in China, which was the major exporter of rice to San Francisco, had nearly exhausted the supply and it caused the price to rise from four cents to 36 cents a pound. Now, maybe it was insider trading or just normal business, but two minute the merchant exchange told Norton that a ship was in the harbor from Peru with some 200,000 pounds of rice and he could have it all for $25,000 for 12 and a half cents a pound. But well aware of San Francisco's insatiable lust for rice and with a tempting profit of $47,000, Norton agreed and bought the rice. The next day, a second ship pulled into the harbor full of Peruvian rice, and another, and another, and another. The market was flooded, and rice fell to three cents a pound. 
However, even worse was that the rice that was coming in was of a better quality to what Norton found when he went into his ship. So he refused to pay, stating the samples he'd been shown were, were not the poor quality that he found on board. But following a two and a half year lawsuit, Norton lost. The lawsuit was expensive for Norton, but even worse, the boom was over. The banks were failing, real estate prices dropped, and Norton was soon forced to file for bankruptcy. Now the directory still listed him as a commission agent, but work appeared to have been very sketchy and Joshua Norton was soon just another lost soul in the great city. Have we an emperor among us? On September 17th, 1859, George Fitch, who was the, the editor of the San Francisco Bulletin, was sitting at his desk when a man he described as neatly dressed and serious looking, handed him a piece of paper. The next morning, Fitch ran a headline, have we an emperor among us and printed the following proclamation. At the preemptory request of a large majority of the citizens of these United States, I, Joshua Norton, formerly of Algoa Bay, Cape of Good Hope, and now for the last nine years and 10 months past of San Francisco, California, declare and proclaim myself the emperor of these United States. And in virtue of the authority thereby in me vested do hereby in order and direct the representatives of the different states of the union to assemble in the musical hall of this city on the first day of February next and make such alterations in the existing laws of the union as may ameliorate the evils under which this country is laboring and thereby cause confidence to exist both at home and abroad in our stability and integrity. The guy could be president, let alone emperor. Well, another notice a month later was printed by the San Francisco Bulletin. And they note, take notice the world, his Emperor Majesty Norton I has issued the following edict, which he desires the Bulletin to spread before the world. Let her rip. It is represented to us that the universal suffrage as now existing throughout the Union is abused, that fraud and corruption prevent a fair and proper expression of the public voice that open violations of the laws are constantly occurring caused by mobs, parties, factions, and undue influence of political sex. That the citizen has not that protection for person and property which he is entitled to pay his, entitled to by paying his pro rata of the expense of government. In consequence of which we do hereby abolish Congress and it is therefore abolished. How simple is that? Therefore abolished. And we order and desire the representatives of all parties interested to appear at Musical Hall of the city on February next and there and take the most effective steps to remedy the evil complained of. Norton I, Emperor of the United States and uh, not protector of Mexico yet, but okay. And then I, I love this one uh, on January 4th, 1860. He said, a body of men calling themselves the National Congress are in session in Washington in violation of our imperial edict of the 12th of October, abolishing Congress. And so he then directs the uh, Major General Scott of the Commander in Chief of the Armies to, with a suitable force, clear the halls of Congress. And on this particular proclamation in 1860, uh, he says it's an undoubted truth that Mexico is entirely unfit to manage her own affairs the country being in constant state of internal distraction, anarchy and civil war, anarchy and civil war. And whereas his Imperial Majesty Napoleon III is throwing his protecting arm around unfortunate Italy, we consider it our duty to shield and protect bleeding Mexico. And that is where Joshua Norton now became the protector of Mexico. And as this goes on, he asks that a convention of nations assemble in the halls of Montezuma and we also uh, order troops to assemble in Mexico and to take and control the government. And then I do, I threw this one because I love this one. Norton the first, de Gracia, who oh, being desirous of allaying the dissensions of party strife now existing within our realm, do hereby dissolve and abolish the Democratic and Republican parties and do hereby decree disfranchisement and imprisonment for not more than 10 nor less than five years to all persons leading to any violation of this, our imperial decree. Is this 2021 or 1869? I'm just loving the stuff that he's, he's putting out here. Now it's also said some of these proclamations uh, that Norton put out 
there's one that's been often quoted that whoever after due and proper warning shall be heard to utter the abominable word Frisco, which has no linguistic or other warrant shall be deemed guilty of a high dismeanor and shall pay into the imperial treasury as penalty, the sum of $25. That's a pretty stiff fine. Unfortunately, none of the Norton researchers we have been able to find anywhere where this was printed. And it's one of those after the fact pieces that have come out. And now it is part of history that everybody says Norton did it. Well, we mentioned the sum of $25 to the Imperial Treasury. So how did Norton fund his new empire? Well, he issued his own money. He had San Francisco printers print the Imperial government of Norton I, promises to pay the holder thereof the sum of 50 cents in the year 1880. So if you bought his notes, you were paid back at 7% interest. And there was other than 50 cent notes, there was also $5 notes and $10 notes. So Norton just printed his own money, which was gladly accepted by the merchants of San Francisco. The town completely accepted Norton, took the money, and the uh, imperial government was doing well with their income. Now, one of the legends of Norton the first are the two San Francisco dogs known as Bummer and Lazarus seen here. And there is a plaque at the Transamerica building, at the base of the Transamerica building, uh, about Bummer and Lazarus. And I'll just read the plaque and we'll tell you the story. Bummer and Lazarus were two stray dogs who roamed this part of San Francisco in the 1860s. Their devotion to each other endeared them to the citizenry, and the newspapers reported their joint adventures, whether stealing a bone from another dog, uncovering a nest of rats, or stopping a runaway horse. Though authorities destroyed other strays on site, the city permitted these two to run free. Indeed, they were welcomed regular customers at popular eating and drinking establishments on Montgomery Street. Contrary to common belief, they were not Emperor Norton's dogs. They belonged to no one person. They belonged to San Francisco. When Lazarus died in October of 1863, followed by Bummer in November of 1865, a reporter for the San Francisco Bulletin described them thus. Two dogs with but a single bark, two tails that wagged as one. Uh, the plaque dedicated by that secret society, Yerba Buena chapter number one of Eclampus Vitus. So though truly Bummer and Lazarus were not his dogs, they were often portrayed together. Uh, a cartoonist of the time, an illustrator named Edward Jump, who was in San Francisco in the 1860s up until 1865, uh, drew a number of cartoons about Norton. So here's uh, a piece called Three Bummers in 1863, showing Emperor Norton lunching with Bummer and Lazarus. They're waiting for the table scraps to fall down. Now that plaque mentioned the rats, uh, that they were ratters. And rats were a huge problem in San Francisco. And Bummer and Lazarus were noted rat catchers. They would be catching them all day long. And so, you know, the restaurants loved them, that they're getting rid of the rat problem that they may have had. So they were very welcome. And actually there was also a, a, uh, a bummer in, San Fran in Santa Barbara. So Santa Barbara had its own copycat dog and uh, the citizens of San Francisco gave a silver collar for the dog that had his name on it. But that's another story. Uh, Lazarus was possibly poisoned and died in October 1863. And here again, another cartoon by uh, Edward Jump. And we see the funeral procession coming up he drew Emperor Norton as the minister giving the final blessing to the dog. And a character named that we're going to meet a little later, George Washington II, is digging the grave for, uh, for Lazarus. And actually, Lazarus was not buried. Uh, the owner of one of the saloons where the dogs hung out, uh, Frederick Martin's saloon, uh, Mr. Martin got a hold of the body of Lazarus and had it stuffed. And so that's the picture that you saw at the very opening of this segment. So great characters. Now, Edward Jump always puts this little drummer boy and I don't know who he is, but he's in a lot of the cartoons of Edward Jump. So then in, then in November of 1865, um, Bummer passed away. He was kicked by a drunk and suffered for several days before finally dying. And the drunk's name luckily was saved for all time. His name was Henry Rippey. And Henry Rippey did not fare well at the citizens of San Francisco following his uh, fateful kick to the dog. So again, uh, Edward Jump has Bummer lying in state 
and he's attended to by the raps, give, giving him a farewell. And up in heaven, Lazarus is preparing a wonderful meal as Bummer is about to uh, ascend back up. And again, uh, Bummer was stuffed and also placed into the tavern. And I think the San Francisco fire of 1906 wiped out the, the saloon and the remains of Bummer and Lazarus. So what is it like to be an emperor? So let's go through the emperor's day. Uh, this is the 1865 city directory and it notes Joshua Norton, his occupation, emperor. San Francisco completely bought into this. They went all for Emperor Norton and, as, and we'll find out some of the things that they, they did by taking him in, but it notes that his dwelling is at 624 Commercial Street, San Francisco. And uh, this is a very rare photo that recently surfaced and it shows uh, Commercial Street here and Kearney Street along this edge here. And so the building right there underneath my red dot is 624 Commercial Street. It was a boarding house known as the Eureka Lodgings. And the emperor occupied a sparsely furnished, it was a nine foot by six foot room on the top floor, cost him 50 cents per night. And with the imperial treasury behind him, he could certainly afford it. And when he couldn't afford it, people came forward and paid the money to help out if needed. But generally he did pretty, he, I guess he did pretty good on his 50 cents a night uh, lodgings there. So the emperor in the morning would get up from 624 Commercial Avenue. He would head up to Portsmouth Square and greet his subjects and uh, feel the morning sun coming in and stroll along the pathways. And about noon, he would head to one of the several taverns in town. Now, in the, in the taverns of town, you got a free lunch if you bought a drink. Well, the emperor didn't drink, but he would get the free lunch and I guess the drink would go to somebody else. And of course, he did not have to pay for it because he was the emperor. And a lot of the stores would uh, love it because if, if Norton was there. So they would put signs in their windows that say, Norton, you know, Norton uh, buys here, Norton eats here. So it was quite an honor to have the emperor come into your place. So uh, following his noon lunch, uh, he would head from there to some of the various libraries in the neighborhood. Uh, the library is offered by the Bohemian Club, the Mercantile Institute, and the Mechanics Institute. So three places that uh, he would go and he was accepted. He was said to be an excellent chess player. He was capable of talking about any subject with high intelligence and wit. Now he got to ride for free on all the ferries and the streetcars. And even Leyland Stanford, the president of the Central Pacific Railroad, gave him a free pass for the railroads in California. It was a great thing to be emperor. So let's take a look at his world here. So here's San Francisco. Uh, this is Columbus coming down this way and Market Street coming down this way. We've got the uh, waterfront behind us. So 624 Commercial Street was right here. He just had to go up a block and a half over here to Portsmouth Square. And this is an area called the Promenade we're going to visit, or Promenade we're going to visit here in a second between uh, Montgomery and Kearney, Jackson and Sutter. Well, the places that we also mentioned, uh, when he when he would leave his place at 624 Commercial Street, he might also stop off at another place, the, I think it was either the Eureka uh, lodgings uh, and read the morning papers there. Uh, he would also head over to the Bohemian, the Bohemian Club, which had two addresses. They were over on, uh, they were over on Sacramento Street between 1873 and 1876, uh, right about in here. And then they moved over to Pine Street in 1877 at 430 Pine. So that, that leads an interesting question about uh, Norton going to the Bohemian Club because it's a, it's a private club and they were very discriminatory in the members, which we'll look, take a look at another photograph in just a second. The two other places that he went to were the Mercantile Library at Bush, Sansom and Treasury, which is right about here on this corner. And also over here was the Mercantile Library and uh, or the, the Mechanics Institute Library, and they had the chess room up there, and that's where you know he would go and spend a day reading or playing chess. So this was pretty much his world, uh, this seven or eight block section around in here. Now here's the the first Bohemian Club rooms at 430 Pine, and 
the Bohemian Club has a mascot of an owl. And so this was a cage that had uh, live two, I think two live owls in it, or at least one. Now the Bohemian Club was exclusive with its membership. They wanted writers and artists. And so, but Norton was able to use the Bohemian Club library though he was not a member. So either the head of the Bohemian Club thought the emperor, of course, who would turn away the emperor? So he was given free reign to use their library. Uh, also Robert Louis Stevenson was uh, given that honor. But uh, either because Norton being the emperor or also since they, uh, liked you know the, the whole thing they were all actors and writers and one of the greatest writers in San Francisco at this point is someone who's writing his own proclamations and as an actor someone posing as the emperor of the United States and having an audience completely accept the role he's playing what better actor could you possibly have so possibly that was his entry to the bohemian club uh certainly uh he whatever whatever it was they let him in now in the evenings, the emperor would go to lectures, the theaters, debating clubs. Now he had reserved seating at all the operas and uh, on opening night, the, the orchestra would pay a fanfare as he walked in and the audience would stand as the emperor came in and then sit once he was seated. And as one person said, it's only in San Francisco, could you go to a play and see Henry V on stage and Norton I in the balcony? On the weekends, he went to churches and he favored no particular church because as emperor, he didn't want to be particular to one or another. So he split up his church going duties amongst the many San Francisco churches. Uh, Norton was also a staunch advocate for women's rights as well as racial equality for the Chinese and for African-Americans. Somewhat way ahead of his time, it would seem. Uh, Norton also would go to the Presidio and review the troops, which uh, I don't, I forget who the artist was for this piece, but there he is reviewing the troops at the Presidio. He would also go up to Sacramento at times and sit in and listen to the various things and clear his throat and thump his cane on the floor if he didn't like something. At one point, he was arrested in San Francisco, and I believe it was for vagrancy. vagrancy. And the papers, of course, were completely up in arms about that. And the one paper wrote that the emperor has never shed blood, has robbed no one, despoiled no country, and that gentleman is a hell of a lot more than could be said for anyone else in this king line. Uh, with proper apologies, he was released and he forgave everybody as only an emperor can. Now, I, I mentioned the promenade, that seven block stretch between Montgomery, Kearney, Jackson and Sutter streets. And this was just a ongoing parade of personalities and people. So here's Montgomery Street in San Francisco of 1865. And Edward Jump here has some of the characters rolling along the streets here. Uh, this is Ambling Along Montgomery Street by Edward Jump. And some of the eccentric individuals in San Francisco, besides Emperor Norton, there was the Money King, the Gutter Snipe, the King of Pain, the Great Unknown, George Washington II. And, and so here we have Norton strolling the street. George Washington II. I believe this is the gutter snipe. We've got uh, Bummer and Lazarus down here. Uh, Stockbrokers up here with nobody identified. This was just sort of a thing about stockbrokers. And again, that little drummer boy. Now, as for George Washington II, he was a gentleman known as George, he was known as uh, Frederick Coombs. And he fancied himself quite the ladies' man. And there was some sort of a disagreement supposedly between George Washington II and Emperor Norton, and there was insults alleged going back and forth between the two. And accordingly, the, uh, the emperor ordered the chief of police to, to seize upon the person of Professor Coombs, falsely called Washington number two, as a seditious and turbulent fellow and to have him sent forthwith for his own good and the public good to the state lunatic asylum for at least 30 days. And Professor Coombs did leave San Francisco not long afterwards. And I found him in uh, Buffalo, New York, advertising his skills as a matrimonial union promoter who, quote, had given away thousands of dollars to poor ladies to assist them getting married. And he went on to a few other cities from there, another great character. And if somebody hasn't written a book about him already, that they should. But he was no match for Norton, and he had to leave the Imperial City and find his uh, work elsewhere. 
Another character along strolling those seven blocks of the Great Promenade was a man known as the Great Unknown. He was always dapper. He wore the nattiest of hats, the most perfect fitting boots and gloves. And he had uh, a dainty cane. And what everybody noted was his luxurious head of hair. And he at one point rented some rooms and then took on people to come in to talk to him and present himself to the public and to the world. Gave interesting interviews. One of the questions of him, have you had any children? And he said, of course not. I am a male and, and incapable of producing a, of caring and producing a child. Very interesting fellow. And his name was Frederick Wilhelm Fromm. And I don't know where he disappeared to, but another one of the great characters of San Francisco walking the streets with Emperor Norton. This was a great photograph of the emperor uh, taken by the photographer uh, Edward Moybridge. Uh, riding a bicycle or a velocipede as it was called. And when this was printed, it said that the emperor did not care for this picture. It was, it was undignified for an emperor to be riding such a device. And supposedly he smashed the window with his cane. And, uh, but there he is, the emperor riding a bicycle. Now, we mentioned the bridge at the beginning of the talk. And here is how the bridge came about. A proclamation was given by the emperor that a suspension bridge be built from Oakland Point to Goat Island, and Goat Island today is uh, Yerba Buena Island. So a suspension bridge be built from Oakland Point to Goat Island and thence to Telegraph Hill, provided such a bridge can be built without injury to the navigable waters of the Bay of San Francisco. He added a Central Pacific Railroad be granted franchises to lay down tracks and run cars from Telegraph Hill and along the city front to Mission Bay and deeds of lands be given to the empire, which we'll ignore and move forward. So here's a map of the San Francisco Bay at the time. There's Goat Island, known as Yerba Buena Island, Oakland. And so he said a bridge shall be built to connect, to connect the two. He had a further proclamation that believing Oakland Point to be the proper and only point of communication from this side of the bay, to San Francisco, we, Norton I, de Gracia, Emperor of the United States and Protector of Mexico, do hereby command the cities of Oakland and San Francisco to make an appropriation for paying the expense of a survey to determine the practicability of a tunnel under the water, and if found practical, that said tunnel be forthwith built for railroad communication. So there's the BART tube as we know it today. Now I had mentioned in my in the editorial that I mentioned earlier on, on the KABC that the tunnel be going to the Hawaiian Islands. And so that was something that had been uh, known at the time that it was supposed to go to the Hawaiian Islands. It's since been found that he never said anything about a tunnel going to the Hawaiian Islands. Though supposedly he was once again in communication with the King of Hawaii and discourse back and forth. And a lot of that is because the other San Francisco newspapers used to put in fake proclamations of Norton. So sometimes it's hard to tell which is a true Norton proclamation and which was just something in silliness given out at his expense. I found this 1870 census record uh, and here we have Joshua Norton um, and it says his gives his position as emperor and his and it also notes he's insane and this note here says he's incapable of voting. So Kind of sad that someone, this is the only time I've ever seen anything in print like this, noting that the emperor possibly had some sort of mental condition. Well, in French, le roi moi, the king is dead. On the rainy evening of Thursday, January 8th, 1880, the emperor headed out to attend the regular meeting and monthly debate of the Hastings Society at the Academy of Natural Sciences. Uh, he left his home at 624 Commercial Street, uh, headed up Commercial Street, moved over one block to the southeast corner of California and DuPont, which is now, uh, DuPont's now Grant Avenue. And just across the street from the Academy, which would have been right here, he collapsed and he died. Now the San Francisco Chronicle reported that at least 10,000 people came to view the emperor's body as it lay in state. And uh, once again, legend states that the emperor's body uh, going to his final resting place that it was a two mile long uh, prominent uh, procession 
following the emperor to the Masonic to the Masonic Cemetery in San Francisco. And other accounts, though, say that there was just several hundred people that followed the emperor to his resting place. And Masonic Cemetery was where uh, the University of San Francisco is now, around Turk, Fulton, and uh, Masonic Streets. Well, as, San Fran as years went on, San Francisco started growing, and they started taking away several of these old cemeteries, closing them up and, and moving the bodies elsewhere. And so the emperor was just one of those people. In June of 1934, Norton was uh, moved from the, form, from the old Masonic Cemetery to the Woodlawn Cemetery in Coma, and this is in South San Francisco, by members of the Pan Union Pacific, the Pan, the Pacific Union Club, rather, who in 1934 convened themselves as the Ad Hoc Emperor Norton Memorial Association. And so they raised the funds and they had a proper tombstone put up for Norton and befitting an emperor, there was a 21 gun salute for his reburial in 1934. And here's the emperor's gravestone up in, uh, up in Colma and Norton I, emperor of the United States and protector of Mexico, Joshua A. Norton, 18, 18, 19, actually 1818 was his real, there's a whole debate about even about when his birth was. But it's pretty much been determined now that his birthday was in actually in, in 1818. And now Colma, it's not a large city, but you know, a large city they call metropolis, but Colma is called a necropolis because there's only 1,200 people that live there, but there's 1.5 million people buried there. And the last time I was up there, the mayor had a bumper sticker on his car that read, It's great to be alive in Colma. Now the emperor's tomb and his legend are not forgotten. Once a year, members of that secretive ancient and honorable order V. Clampus Vitus gather at Malloy's Tavern in Colma and Malloy's motto, it's an old tavern and their motto is since before you were born. And the Clampers uh, have lunch and have adult beverages and a few cigars. And then they proceed to the grave of Norton I to pay him due respect. So here's the members of V. Clampus Vitus gathered at the cemetery by um, Norton's grave. The Slippery Gulch Band comes up and plays uh, live, lively tunes for the occasion. And a speech is always uh, welcomed by Norton the first, or Norton rather the second, the third or the fourth, whoever's uh, there present, and sometimes all of them are present and they give the proclamation for the day. And about that bridge, a plaque was dedicated to the Norton the first bridge and the plaque was dedicated on February 25th, uh, 1939. And it states, pause traveler and be grateful to Norton I, Emperor of the United States, protector of Mexico from 1859 to 1880, whose prophetic wisdom conceived and decreed the bridging of San Francisco Bay on August 18th, 1869. Now this was put out just a few days after the opening of the World's Fair in Treasure Island. And there was a start of the streetcar service was to go out to the bridge by the Trans Bay Terminal. But the California Toll Bridge Authority decided uh, not to mount the plaque. And so currently now it has been remounted and it's over on bus bay number 10 on the third level of the just reopened Salesforce Transit Center in San Francisco. And there is a move, there is still a movement to rename the bridge, the Emperor Norton, the first bridge. And they're trying to do it uh, and have it finished by next year and have a proclamation or even get it on the ballot to have the people vote on it of California. And we'll, I'll give you the website for this in just a little while. So a plaque has been issued. Oh yeah, and once again, notice Bummer and Lazarus, though not actually his dogs, are there alongside of him. When the legend becomes fact, Print the legend and the great chronicler of the West, Maxwell Scott, when he was working on the story of Ransom Stoddard and found that the legend was not quite true, just said, print the legend. And that has certainly been the case with Emperor Norton. There's been many publications over the years uh, put out by Norton. And as I'm going through, now that more and more newspapers are, on, are getting digitized and available online, and you can start finding quotes about Norton and information that after his death, there is a number of times where people would write about the, the, odd Nor the odd emperor of San Francisco or the odd emperor of the United States and the story about Norton. 
and they're quoting people that knew Norton and time may have uh, affected their memory a little bit as what they exactly remember he did. And more and more things got uh, added to the Norton story, uh, like the BART tube going to Hawaii, uh, visualizing all the different Bay Bridges uh, in addition to the, the Oakland Bay Bridge. And so some of these stories were then picked up by writers who put out books. We have great books like The Forgotten Characters of Old San Francisco, The Memorable Lives of Bummer and Lazarus, Emperor Norton, The Mad Monarch of America, and more and more books coming out. And some of them are spot on, others have errors, but it's not their fault. They just didn't know the exact information because they're looking at newspapers and articles that were uh, incorrect. Plus there's all the fake proclamations that newspapers printed. For example, there's uh, one about that uh, he, during the Civil War that Norton offered elephants to Abraham Lincoln to help with the Union cause. There's uh, proposals of marriage to Queen Victoria to unite all the countries together. So there's a few things that are just, they sound great and they're a lot of fun, but uh, researchers are finding that these aren't always quite right. And, and as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the stories that I first used in this program 15 years ago have proven to be legend. And one I just used a few weeks ago. In, in 1876, the emperor, or 1875, 1876, the emperor of Brazil, Dom Pedro II, was coming up to San Francisco. And according to the story, he asked to meet Emperor Norton at his suite in the Palace Hotel. And he had taken up four huge suites at the palace. And Emperor Norton came in and they met at the royal suite and talked for more than an hour. And according to the story that Dom Pedro never knew whether he realized that the United States didn't or didn't have an emperor, but he treated, he met Norton and treated him as a fellow emperor. So another story that sadly is great, but turns out to be untrue. And so with that, we're rolling up our talk for the evening. And I would like to recommend you, if you want to know more about Emperor Norton Trust, or Emperor Norton, the best website I've seen so far is called the Emperor Norton Trust. And the, to get there, it's emperornortontrust.org.org. And a gentleman named John Lumia has put it together and it is a phenomenal piece of work. I really take my hat off to the work that's been put in there. There's a lot of other places to go. There's a lot of books that you can buy and a lot of websites that you can go to, but this is the best one. And he's also got the petition and the information to rename the bridge to the Emperor Norton, the first bridge. And so I'm hoping that you will join me and sign that petition and get the proclamation going to get the bridge named for Emperor Norton. And I'd like to thank the Bancroft Library, Wells Fargo Bank, the Bohemian Club, the Pat Hathaway Photo Collection, California Historical Society, the E. Clampus Vitus Historical Archives, and uncredited Google images from who knows where. That's one of the problems of pulling photographs from off the internet is you have no idea where they came from, but uh, I try to find out where I can. So with that, thank you all very much. And always remember the Emperor Norton Trust and let's get this going. So thank you.